Good evening. Here's what's happening. We're interrupting our special broadcasting to bring you this special report, um, a new C news break on the People's Temple mass suicides in Guyana and the murder of Congressman Leo Ryan. I would mention to you now. There's been an incident in Guyana in which an American congressman and several newsmen have been killed. I also have to warn you as we begin this special report that what you're about to see almost defies description, and some of you may not want to watch it. The clump of trees in the center of the clearing is a five-acre pig pasture. On November 18th, 1978, the biggest mass murderer slash suicide was witnessed by the road. Over 900 people died that day, including 300 or so who were less than the age of 17. Most of them were unwilling to accept their fate and were forced to drink a concoction made up of Kool-Aid and cyanide. What exactly led to this national tragedy in the first place? This all stemmed from one man's twisted desire and his depraved view of his own fate. He was one of the most influential cult leaders of the 21st century. This is the story of Jim Warren Jones. You don't know what you're missing down here? You are watching Dark Boy. On May 13, 1931, a family in the rural town of Crate, Indiana was blessed with a young boy. His name was James Warren Jones. Growing up, Jones experienced life in an incomplete family. His father was a war veteran who suffered from his disabilities and could not maintain a proper job, eventually leading to his family being evicted from their own home. The Jones family had to resort to relatives and scavenging to keep themselves alive. Jones's mother was also described to be incompetent as later in the biography written by Jones himself, he stated that she had no maternal instinct and would often leave James neglected. The two parents were often absent from Jones's childhood and he would spend much of his time with his neighbors and relatives. However, Jones had no signs of being a troubled child. He was described to be quite pleasant by the people around him. He was even one of the few that attended church regularly, perhaps to fill in the parental role which was absent away from his life. As a young child, he developed this habit and it stretched all the way to adulthood, never missing a single day of Sunday school. In 1945, Jones's parents divorced and his mother was awarded his full custody. Jones described this period as a dark time, a place where he did not want to reflect back into. To make ends meet, Jones went out of his way to work at a hospital, but this would not last long. He was reported to have disturbing behaviors amongst the elderly, one instance being that he was caught taunting them about them not having long on this road. After getting fired from the hospital, he went to work at a local restaurant. As he became a regular attender at the local church, he was noticed by one person in particular, Myrtle Kennedy, the wife of the pastor of the church he was attending. She would fill in the role of the mother figure that was absent from Jones's childhood. The two would discuss endlessly about the interpretation of the Bible and she would take him to church multiple times a week. This was when Jones became more and more engulfed with the idea of religion. He looked up to those with power. He swore to become one of them and would worship hours and hours at a time. This action, however, was disturbing to his parents and neighbors. He was obsessed with spirituality and the ideal of death. In his spare time, he would borrow books from the library about radical extremists and dive deep in their different political and spiritual doctrines. He was infatuated by Hitler's ability to conjure up large groups of people to spread his ideals. He found the teachings of communism to be vastly more efficient than the one that Americans adore, capitalism. This may be because growing up, he was at a constant state of poverty, this amounting to a hatred towards materialistic ideals. He even once shouted Heil Hitler to a German war prisoner who was crossing his town. He strived to be similar, as in school he would often lecture students on what they should or should not dress and how they should act. He held a conservative standpoint, which never fit into any friend groups, thus making him a loner. As Jones reached into his teenage years, the loneliness barricaded his mentality. In his biography, Jones' exact words were, I was ready to kill by the end of grade 3. I mean, I was so aggressive and hostile. Nobody gave me love, any understanding. In those days, a parent was supposed to go to a child to the school functions. There was some kind of school performance, and everybody's parents were there but mine. I'm standing there, alone. I was so alone. However, things would turn for him as he got into university. Perhaps he was able to hide his ideals and his urge to conflict with other people's lifestyle. 
Jones would meet and marry his wife Marcelin in 1949 in his vision of creating a happy family. Throughout the years, Jones would be constantly going to church, but he would oppose his wife attending it and would pressure her to give up the belief and accept atheism. He definitely had other intentions of going to church than religious means. From early morning, St. Peter's Square, filled with devout people, drawn by one of the highest ceremonies of the Catholic Church, the coronation in St. Peter's Basilica of the new Pope. The church was the only way to go. He saw how an influential person can move the masses. After graduation, he decided to join the ministry to become a church minister. This would not last long, however, because he was an advocate of anti-segregation. Back then, individuals of darker skin color were prohibited to enter some churches. Jones also partook in the latter rain movement, which was basically a mentality that pastor had abilities similar to God. The difference in beliefs led to him leaving the church and starting his own under the name Wings of Healings, which he would later change to People's Temple. At first, the people who joined were few, mostly friends from previous churches. Jones had to think of other ways to attract followers. He got in touch with the Independent Assemblies of God, an international group of churches which also embraced the Latter Rain Movement. At the time, the group needed an outgoing spokesperson, and Jones was the perfect person for the job. He had a captivating sense of charm when he spoke, and people listened. Soon, he drew crowds with his healing rituals, a type of ceremony where a participant is supposedly healed. Throughout the late 1950s, the People's Simple would grow massively in popularity. It attracted many African Americans, and Jones was known to be accepting of all races. Besides that, he was also well known for his ability to heal wounds and disabled simply by preaching. It is here when he started to call himself Jim Jones, the prophet. Due to his work for anti-segregation, he was appointed the director of the local Human Rights Commission in Indianapolis, further spreading his influence. With his newfound power, he was able to desegregate many churches, restaurants, and public locations alike. He and his wife adopted many children who were not Caucasian in ethnicity and named his family the Rainbow Family. As his followers grew, he began to blur the lines between fact and fiction. He started having dreams and visions, which he thought were events destined to happen in the future. One night, after a nightmare, Jones alerted his followers and church officials that he had dreamt of a nuclear attack which ended in the destruction of Indianapolis. The Cold War was in full swing at the time, and this was something which people feared the most. Jim was able to persuade the masses that his vision was going to happen, and the best choice of action was to relocate. He read on a news article which stated that South America was the safest place during a nuclear apocalypse, so he started plotting a retreat. In 1961, he went to Brazil to scout out a location for him and his followers to settle down. He was not able to find one that was suitable, but did relocate his family there. This took a heavy toll on the community of Indiana as without a leader, there was no clear path for his followers to walk. Jin would be in communication with the church and stated that he would return one day to lead again. His followers trusted him without a doubt, but as time went on, he was nowhere in sight. Three years passed since he had initially left, and the ministry back in Indianapolis grew restless of his false promises. They gave him an ultimatum, either to come back and continue his management, or the people's temple will be abolished forever. Seeing the pending doom of his many years of blood and sweat, Jones had no choice but to come back. It was time for Jones to do something drastic. If he was to stay on top, he needed something to strike fear into the hearts of people. As his followers grew and grew, his prophecies became more and more outlandish. He made claims such as the imminent nuclear apocalypse, the Nazis and white supremacists rising up again and enslaving everyone, and much more. He proclaimed that he himself was the Messiah, the second coming of Jesus, and his ego grew along with it. But all these was just a facade for his extreme views in politics. In a later interview with the New York Times, Jones's wife admitted that Jones himself did not actually believe in the teaching of the Bible, but merely wanted to use the religion as a way to spread his own ideals. In order not to show the true nature of his intent within the organization that oversaw the Christianity community in America, Jones needed to act fast before his name fell into tarnishment. During the early 1970s, Jones fell into negative publicity when many of his healing rituals were found to be staged. 
other accounts of abusive treatment to women and even the case of rape of a male member of the church by the hands of Jones himself led to the fall of his name, which was once held so highly. A further investigation ensued which led to the mounting media pressure on Jones. He had a mental breakdown and was arrested and charged with masturbating in front of an undercover cop within the washroom of a theater. Feeling the loss of power, Jones decided that it was time for him to take an initial plan to action. In late 1973, Jones and 50 or so of his followers packed up their bags and set out to Guyana, a country in South America located above Brazil. Development had been swift. Jones purchased land and supplies and wanted to structure a communist community called Jonestown. By late 1977, Jonestown had already accumulated 1,000 residents. However, the reputation of Jonestown was heavily criticized by the United States. Aside from the differences of political view, there were also allegations of physical and emotional abuse. Many of those who wanted to leave Jonestown couldn't because they simply weren't allowed to. Among the deeds done by Jones, these were just scratching the surface. There were allegations of Jones having a sexual relationship with Grace Dion, which resulted in her giving birth to a kid named John. Upon hearing these rumors, Grace's husband, Timothy, left the temple, which was followed by Grace, leaving John alone in the care of Jones himself. This was only until two years later in 1978 when Timothy came back to reclaim the custody of his son. A lawsuit ensued which led to the increasing pressure from media resulting in Timothy winning his child back. During this time, most of Jones' political allies broke ties with Jones, and in the summer of 1978, Concerned relatives of the residents of the People's Temple provided a document to the public accounting for Jones' violation of human rights as they have not seen their family member since way back as of 1973, five years ago. As the law tightened its grip around Jones' neck, he needed to find ways to alleviate and began negotiating with the Soviet Union, planning to relocate the entirety of Jonestown to the communist country. Alongside, Jones started to train an army, holding drills that was called White Knights. He would have his people gathered in a pavilion and stay until he thought fit. He told his people that the town was surrounded by capitalist agents and they were needed to be on high alerts at all time. Once, a drill lasted for six straight days, where his followers were basically trapped in the pavilion and Jones and his guards simulated gunfire outside of the town. Jones thought that an attack by the US government was imminent and even told his people one night that Jonestown was about to fall and they needed to drink poison as to not be caught and tortured. The poison was just lemon water, but the so-called drill left a sour taste in people's mouth. A lurking question came from the residents of Jonestown. Did Jones really plan to have everyone in the town commit mass suicide? The answer would come quite shortly. As these labor-heavy drills and manual work went on, the residents' physical and mental health all deteriorated rapidly. Mules were short on rations, and Jones would dedicate heavy hours in preaching, sometimes forcing his followers to do so. He soon began to talk about how everyone would be at peace in the afterlife and that people should welcome death with open arm. Of course, while his people were working about, Jones was enjoying life, being heavily reliant on drug and alcohol. It was in November of 1978 when Congressman Leo Ryan paid a visit to Jonestown for an investigation on the violation of human rights. I think that all of you know that I'm here to find out more about uh, questions that have been raised about your operation here. But I can tell you right now that from the few conversations I've had with some of the folks here already this evening, that uh, whatever the comments are, there are some people here who believe that this is the best thing that ever happened to them in their whole life. Everything seemed normal at first. Everyone was going about their day by looking a little tired. Jones hosted a reception at the Central Pavilion advocating his achievements at creating such a wonderful community. During the session was when a member of the People's Temple passed a note to Ryan. On it read, Help, we are trapped and cannot leave. The living conditions are horrible and Jones rules us like a dictator. Last night, someone came and passed me this note. Well, that's who we're talking about. He wants to leave his son here. If Jones sounds such a bad place, why does he want to leave his son here? Doesn't it concern you, though, that, that this man, for whatever reason, one of the people in your group... People was... play games, friend. They lie. They lie. What can I do about liars? Are you people going, leave us. I just beg you, please leave us. Bill, we will bother nobody. Anybody wants to get out of here can get out of here. On the second day of the visit, Congressman Ryan left early from the town with several members inconspicuously. 
This was all done without Jones knowing, but it did not take long for him to realize that the missing people and decided to chase after them. The members of the People's Temple caught up with Ryan and his crew when they were just about to step into their plane and opened fire, killing five people, which included Ryan. The rest escaped into the jungle and was later rescued and brought to safety. With there being survivors, Jones was certain that the US would send military troops and take them all out. He called a meeting in the central pavilion and informed his followers that military would soon come and kill everyone in the town. He had been preparing this day for a long while. The poison drills he performed beforehand were not to exist for no reason. He ordered the most loyal followers to bring out a pot which contained Kool-Aid and cyanide and gave people a portion of it to drink. They drank the concoction one at a time, and when others saw that the people who drank it started collapsing and convulsing, they rejected the idea of drinking the concoction as they did not want to die. Those who did not comply were forced, prying their mouth open and pouring the concoction down. Some were even injected with cyanide through a syringe. Jones recorded himself preaching through the mass suicide, creating some of the most disturbing audio recording in human history. How very much I've tried my best to give you the good life and there's no way no way we can survive well, you regret that this very day if you don't die and we're all ready to go if you tell us we have to give our lives now we're ready i'm pretty sure all the rest of the brothers are with me talking the congressman has been murdered please get us the medication it's simple there's no convulsions with it it's just simple just please get it before it's too late the gdf will be here i tell you get moving get moving get moving we've lived we've lived as no other people have lived and loved we've had as much of this world as you're gonna get let's just be done with it let's be done with the agony of it honest and i'm sure that they'll they'll pay for it they'll, they'll pay for it this is a revolutionary suicide this is not a self-destructive suicide so they'll pay for this they brought this upon us no more pain, Al. No more pain, I said, Al. No more pain. Some residents of Jonestown were lucky and slipped away as the chaos ensued. The incident lasted hours, and afterwards, a central pavilion stood still, with hundreds of dead bodies surrounding it. This left 909 people dead, 304 of them being children. The Guyanese military were the first to reach the wretched scene, and in collaboration with the U.S. military, airlifted all the bodies. Jones's body was found on a chair in the central pavilion with a gunshot to his head. He didn't even have the guts to drink the poison he made for his followers, as drinking cyanide does result in an excruciating death. This concludes the story of the Jonestown Massacre. So what are your thoughts on cults and the events that surround them? I know it's a taboo subject, but leave a comment as I will be reading every single one of them. If you enjoy the video, leave a like or subscribe because I'll be making more videos in the future.